I think that the modern day abortion industry is exactly that. It is child sacrifice. The mother or the father or the industry itself is just offering up these children uh, to the God of self, uh, the God of convenience. My name is Timothy Brindle. I'm the Senior Stewardship Officer here at Westminster Theological Seminary, a pastor at Olive Street Presbyterian Church, and a PhD student in the Old Testament. And I'm sitting here with my advisor, Dr. Johnny Gibson, one of my favorite people in the world. How are you today, Johnny? I'm well. Thanks for having me, Tim. Absolutely. Johnny, I'd like to talk with you about a very hot-button topic, namely abortion. Johnny, could you take a few moments and share with us what does the Bible have to say about abortion? Well, the Bible doesn't actually use the word abortion, uh, but it does speak to the issue of abortion. I think in Exodus chapter 20, when Moses gives the Ten Commandments, I think the Sixth Commandment uh, speaks into the issue of abortion. You shall not murder. Uh, the Westminster Larger Catechism expands on each of the commandments, speaking about duties required in the commandment and sins prohibited in the commandment, and it speaks about participating in careful studies and lawful endeavors to preserve the life of another, and also resisting all practices that would take away the life of another. And so I think um, with that kind of application of the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, I think the Bible speaks very clearly into the issue of abortion. What about someone saying, well, okay, you're referring to the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, but I don't even think that that thing in the mom's womb is a person yet. So to do away with uh, or, or abort uh, the fetus is not actually murder. How does scripture speak to that, Johnny? Uh, David in Psalm 51 speaks about being conceived in sin in his mother's womb. In sin did my mother conceive me. And notice it's not at the point of viability, but at the point of conception that David understands his existence to have begun. Um, so that would be the first main text, that at the point of conception, David views himself as a person. In Psalm 22, he speaks about God being his God from his mother's womb. And then Psalm 139, I think, speaks into this issue as well. Verse 13, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, notice how the psalmist speaks in personal pronouns and personhood about himself being intricately woven by God. And then there are other examples outside of the Psalms that affirm the personhood of a child in the womb. Jacob and Esau, God says to Rebekah that two peoples are within you in the womb. Uh, and then you have numerous examples uh, in the Old Testament of people being spoken about during their time in the womb as real people. Uh, you have Jacob and Esau, as I've mentioned. You have Samson. You have the servant of the Lord. You have Jeremiah. And then you have John the Baptist. Uh, the angel appears to Elizabeth and says uh, that um, the, he, the child in your womb, shall be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit can only fill a person. And so there's John the Baptist being affirmed as a person in the womb. So I think what we have through pronouns and personhood uh, is people in the Old Testament being spoken of from conception through their time in the womb and up to their birth and after the birth as a person. Johnny, abortion has become normalized in our culture and there's God's covenant people surrounded by uh, unbelievers who see the slaughter of children as something that's fine. Are there any other places in Scripture where God's covenant people were tempted to capitulate and give in to the practices of the unbelieving nations when it came to uh, the, the holiness of life of a child? In Leviticus 18, Moses speaks to that issue. Um, he speaks about a number of things that are an abomination to the Lord. Uh, in Leviticus 18, verse 19 and following, he starts with the issue of sexual promiscuity. 
Uh, then he moves to child sacrifice, verse 21. You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech and so profane the name of the Lord your God, I am the Lord. So he speaks about uh, any sacrifice of a child being uh, an abomination. Um, and then he goes on to speak about homosexuality and bestiality. So there are four sins that are an abomination to God. Sexual promiscuity, uh, child sacrifice, homosexuality, and bestiality. I think that speaks into the issue of abortion. Yes, Leviticus is not speaking about the death or sacrifice of a child in the womb, uh, but I think that the modern day abortion industry is exactly that. It is child sacrifice, where the child is being offered up to the God of self and the God of convenience, because children are viewed these days as an in inconvenience. Uh, either they're going to cost too much money or they have a deformity and therefore it's going to be too much time and care needed to look after the child. And so the mother or the father or the industry itself is just offering up these children uh, to the God of self, uh, the God of convenience. And so I think this passage in Leviticus 18 speaks into the issue of modern day abortion. Well, Johnny, why don't we move to church history? Because this isn't the first time God's people have had to wrestle with the issue of abortion. How far back can we go in church history where we can learn from how the Lord's people applied scripture to the issue of abortion? Well, abortion isn't a modern invention. Uh, the Egyptians were practicing a form of it in the 16th century BC. Uh, they would get women to take potions or uh, exercise vigorously in order to abort the child. Uh, we know the Romans were doing it in the early centuries AD. Uh, and the church has always had to face this issue. Uh, we actually have a document uh, outside of the New Testament towards the end of the first century called the Didache that speaks directly to the issue of abortion. Uh, the longer title of the Didache is the teachings of our Lord through the apostles to the nations. And in one section of the Didache, it speaks of not procuring an abortion or taking the life of a newborn child. So this gives us an insight into how the church was actively speaking into its surrounding culture and engaging the issue of abortion, even in the early centuries of the church. So it's not just a political issue, it's a biblical theological issue that comes down to God's truth, doesn't it, Johnny? Yeah, and that God wants us to speak the truth into the surrounding culture. Right. God views all human life, not just the life of his children or children in the church, but all human life is precious, uh, made in his image, and he wants to preserve that life. And so I think the church needs to be active in being a public voice on this issue. John, and we've spoken to how the Old and New Testament speaks to the issue of abortion, church history. When it comes to pastoral counsel, to someone who's considering an abortion, how would you counsel them, Johnny? Well, I'd want to hear their story. Um, I'd want to hear from the mother or even the father uh, how it is they came to have this child um, and how uh, they ended up being pregnant. Because for some women, it's quite a traumatic experience. Uh, there may be abuse, there may even be rape there involved in uh, them becoming pregnant. And so I'd want to sympathize with them and hear their story. But in the course of the conversation, I would want to move it towards uh, what abortion actually is and what the child is in their womb, that it is a holy thing woven and knit together intricately and in love by God, uh, a person made in the image of God, and try to show them the dignity and the sanctity of the life that is in their womb. Uh, and then I would be encouraging them not to follow through with it, um, to speak to um, a good Bible-believing church or pastor uh, to seek good Christian counseling uh, to help them through that. Now, one of the fears a mother often has is, well, she's thinking, I can't raise this child. Um, I don't have the capacity to or the money to, and I don't want to bring them into a world where they're going to end up uh, not being cared for properly. And so I want to speak to them about the, the option of adoption mm -hmm. and what a lovely avenue that is for them to bring a child into the world and put the child up for adoption so that the child uh, could be taken into a loving family, raised and given a, a good and a healthy life and start uh, to their life. 
So that's what I would want to do as well. Now, the statistics are staggering when it comes to the amount of women who have had an abortion in the church. Mm -hmm. Johnny, how would you speak pastorally with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to a person who has had an abortion? I would want them to know it's not the unforgivable sin. It is a sin. It's a serious sin. It is the taking of the life of an innocent, vulnerable person. Uh, but it's not the unforgivable sin. I'm thinking of John Newton, who we all know from that famous hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Uh, John Newton was a slave trader in his former life before becoming a minister. And he would have participated in the death of many people, either immediate deaths or a slow death through slavery. John Newton, at the end of his life, said, there's two things I know for sure. The first is that I'm a great sinner. And the second is that Christ is a great savior. And that's what I would want to communicate to a mother or a father who has had an abortion. Uh, that is a great sin that you've committed. You are a great sinner, but let me tell you about a great savior. And then I would want to take them to the cross and to that moment when Jesus takes the place of Barabbas. What's interesting is Barabbas uh, is in prison for murder. And yet here is Jesus substituting in the place of a murderer. And I'd want them to see that even the greatest of sins, a sin like murder, has been paid for at the cross by Jesus. And that therefore there is full and free forgiveness. There is a guilt-free life available to those who repent of their sin and put their trust in the Lord Jesus. But I wouldn't just want it to finish there. I'd want to counsel that mother and father uh, to show them that when by faith in Christ they're united to him, he starts to make them whole again. And so I'd want to say to the mother that though you may have made your womb a tomb for a time, God through Christ by his spirit is able to take your womb and make it into a fruitful garden again, if he so pleases. And so I'd want to encourage them towards marriage and towards childbearing again, that actually God can give them children if it pleases him. And they can have um, a life with children, having had this previous experience. Amen, Johnny. Thank you so much. This has been so helpful. We appreciate you greatly. Well, thanks for discussing this important topic with me.